times. So he's very active in, in framing the Constitution. Now he's on the U.S. Supreme Court as an original justice, and he decides to start law schools. This is the first legal textbook written for students. In America. This is James Wilson's textbook that he did for students. Wow. Now, there's a three-volume set that he did for students. In this volume right here, he tells students that you cannot have good civil law if it's not based on divine law. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Wait a minute. I, I didn't think, I thought we had to take Ten Commandments out of the courtroom. No, he's telling us right up front, yeah. if your civil law contradicts divine law, your civil law is wrong. Wow. Now, that sounds to me like he might be using the Bible as the mm -hmm. basis of, wow. of public policy. See, and he's the second most active member of the convention. Uh, he, he's the original justice uh, on the Supreme Court. We don't talk about him. Mm -hmm. See, what we get is a steady diet of folks who do not have that faith perspective, and we're told that's what they wanted. It's not that we don't have some irreligious founders. It's that what's happened in American history is we've decided to make the exception into the rule. We take the irreligious and make that look like it was predominant. And that's absolutely not the case, and their writings make that clear. So the original founders were based upon the Bible and the principles of the Bible. That's right. Go back, go online somewhere, go to a used bookstore, and start pulling out American history textbooks from before 1900. And you're gonna read American history that will just pop your eyes out as you see how often they quote the scriptures. And we used to teach in our textbooks because we cited the writings, we cited the records. We knew who the 250 founding fathers were rather than just five or six that we've kind of picked and choose today. We knew who those guys were. So it's not a problem of we're creating new history by saying they were religious. No, we're just pointing back to their documents right. that used to be printed in the textbooks that no longer are. This is not a matter of lack of documentation to prove that the, the signers of the Constitution, a number of the signers of the Constitution literally were theologians. We have literal theologians who were signers of the Constitution. And you will find in, in the debates, not only after when they did the Constitution, but many of them went into Congress after they did the Constitution, they regularly cite the Bible in pointing back to constitutional clauses and in pointing to laws that they're enacting. I mean, these are federal laws. These are not just opinions of individuals here and there. These are what they did in laws, and this is what we used to know in America. Another of the signers who appears in this painting is James McHenry. James McHenry was a military officer, and he served throughout the American Revolution as aide to General George Washington. When Washington became president, he selected James McHenry as Secretary of War, and McHenry continued in that post also under President John Adams. The sign for the writing of Francis Scott Key's Star Spangled Banner was Fort McHenry, and of course, that fort was named for this signer of the Constitution. James McHenry was also the founder of the Baltimore Bible Society, which today has changed its name to the Maryland Bible Society. Notice James McHenry's forceful declaration on the importance of the Bible in American society. Public utility pleads most forcibly for the general distribution of the Holy Scriptures. These can alone secure to society order and peace, and to our courts of justice and constitutions of government, purity, stability, and usefulness. In vain, without the Bible, we increase penal laws and draw entrenchments around our institutions. Bibles are strong entrenchments. Where they abound, men cannot pursue wicked courses. This signer of the Constitution, James McHenry, believed that the Bible was the best preventative against crime and the best safeguard of civil government. And consider the words of Constitution signers like John Dickinson, who declared, Rendering thanks to my Creator for my birth in a country enlightened by the Gospel, to Him I resign myself, humbly confiding in His goodness and in His mercy through Jesus Christ for the events of eternity. And Gunning Bedford declared, to the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be ascribed all honor and dominion forevermore. Amen. And John Jay, the original Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court and an author of the Federalist Papers, declared, Unto him who is the author and giver of all good, I render sincere and humble thanks for his manifold and unmerited blessings, and especially for our redemption and salvation by his beloved Son. Blessed be his holy name. Clearly, these founding fathers and so many, many others were Christians and were not enemies of Christ despite what current sources may claim. Do you ever cite in history some kind of a fatal 
blow to this rewriting of history or is it just a, a death by a thousand cuts you know it's really death by a thousand cuts we can show that over the past century this has slowly been moving away for example you take someone like george washington uh, this is a guy who was a hero of history for a long time people who knew him were very favorable toward him and then as you move to 1926 a book came out called george washington the image and the man this book by W.E. Woodward said, you know, we always thought we knew George Washington. That was just the image. Let me tell you about the man. He says, oh, he was immoral. And I have that original 1926 book. It does not have a single footnote in the book, not a single footnote. 1927 book came out and tore that book to shreds. Documentary-wise, said, you said Washington did this here. He wasn't even in that state at the time. He was over. And so it just tore it apart. But what happened was in the 1930s, as people wrote textbooks about Washington, they said, you know, Maybe Washington wasn't all he was cracked up to be, and they cite the 1926 book. Then the 1935 books cite the 1930 books, citing the 1926 book. Oh then the 1940 books cite the 1935 books, citing the 19... And so by the time That's you get to today, I can show you a hundred <laughs> books today that say that George Washington was immoral, but none of them predate 1926. They all cite back to that one source. And that's what's happened, is we have tons of documentary source, we have tons of eyewitnesses, we wow. have tons of writings, we have a hundred volumes of the writings of George Washington. Nope, we're going to look at what this guy said in 1926, and that is the authority. And that's what's happened, is death by a thousand cuts. What happens today is because we have a viewpoint that the Constitution is secular, and because we as good citizens want to uphold the Constitution, we don't want to be seen as, as rebels in our own country, We've really come to this kind of a tone and a feeling that if you're pro-faith, pro-religious, you're trying to overturn the Constitution. Wow. You're against Americanism. You're anti-American somehow. Separation of church Separation and state. Separation of church and state. You're trying to overturn the fundamental underpinnings. No, no, no. Being pro-faith is exactly what produced that document. The guys who produced it were themselves pro-faith. They saw that document as a result of biblical ideas that they incorporated in it. They talk about that in their writings during and afterwards. And for us to be pro-faith, we're right in the tone of what the Constitution is. The secular tone that we get today is exactly opposite to what they intended. But because we don't know our history, we're made to feel like outsiders if we want faith involved in the public arena. Wow.